Oh, yeah. Would you like to win free access to Maps Hit, Maps Prime, Maps Performance, and the Intuitive Nutrition Guide? It's the Extreme Fitness Bundle. You can get it for free. Here's what you got to do. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours. Make it a good comment. If we pick your comment as the best one, you'll get access to the Extreme Fitness Bundle for free. Isn't that awesome? Now, the rest of you, turn on your, your notifications, subscribe to this channel so that you know when we post this video so you can enter into our daily contest to win all kinds of free stuff. Also, we're running a huge promotion this new month. It's May. We have Maps Aesthetic is 50% off, and the Extreme Fitness Bundle is 50% off. You can find out more about those or sign up at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code MAYSPECIAL with no space for the discount. Hey, I think your suggestion uh, from the other day was really good oh, uh, for an episode topic. Oh, oh, oh. I was like, wow, this is new. Yeah. I mean, it's new wow, for me, too. I feel Did warm you? and fuzzy right I know. now. <laughs> I'm getting set up right now, I feel like. No, 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 no. Um, I thought it was a great suggestion. You wanted to do an episode on bad advice, so bad uh, fitness oh, advice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That actually is good, but not for the reasons that you think. Mm. And so this might sound a little confusing, but when you said it, I just got all these like, oh, yeah, I know it exactly. It is confusing. I was trying to help, and it wasn't <laughs> helping. So yeah. well, I think I'm we, glad you have this figured out. Well, so, this, yeah, I think we should exp okay, where, where my head was at when I said this. I think you got it, right? You, yeah. to you totally understood where I was going with it. I, I think back of like all the stuff that you know I learned as a trainer and a lot of the information that I communicated that was really bad, the stuff that was good. And a lot of that stuff has flip-flopped. Right. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of things that I used to say that yeah. I, I thought was the truth and, and later on found out that it was not the truth or things that I thought was good advice. And I, later on, I found out was not so good advice. And the same is true on the other side. There was things that I would say was, oh, that's bad advice. That's terrible advice. And now that I've come full circle, I go, you know what, actually? That's actually pretty damn good advice. Yeah, because so in the fitness industry is just notorious, right, for just making things up and, and saying lies to sell products or whatever. But some of the stuff that comes out of the fitness industry is based on results. But then what they try to do is they try to explain why it works. And the way they explain it, the reasoning is all wrong, right? So they'll say, do this thing. And, and you'll say, well, why? And they'll say, well, and they know it works. And when I have clients do this, it works. And when I do it, it works. But then they try to explain it. And they go, oh, it's because, and they'll make up some science. That's, a, totally wrong. that's a great point. Because that it remind, doesn't it remind you of kind of what we talked about with like yoga and massage therapy and like kind of the woo-woo. The language. Yeah, the woo-woo yes. language ends up, you, you get the scientific community that just can't wait to destroy that. Yeah. They just want to come in and be like, that's a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. That is not well, how you It just gets lumped in bro science immediately a lot of times. But yet there is tremendous value in the things that have been in, pra yes. in practice for hundreds of years. I'll give you an example, right? Adrenal fatigue, right? This is a term that, oh, yeah. uh, that, that you know rubs a lot of people the wrong way. But this was really an observation on a whole host of symptoms that a lot of functional medicine practitioners and health coaches were noticing. And they named it adrenal fatigue because they said, okay, the reason why you feel so tired, the reason why you have such bad hot, cold tolerance, mm -hmm. the reason why your metabolism is slow, the reason why your libido is low and you have inflammation is because your adrenals are fatigued and they're not producing enough you know, hormone or whatever. Well, that turned out to be wrong. Now, the symptoms are real, mm -hmm. but their explanation was wrong. Now, the reality is Adrenal fatigue exists, but not because the adrenals are fatigued, but rather because there's a dysfunction between the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the HT, HPTA axis, and the adrenals, right? So you've got, you've got dysfunction between in this axis, and so because of that, your hormones are definitely off, but it's not adrenal fatigue, right? It's not adrenal fatigue. So when I, when I think, when you said that to me, there's one thing that popped in my head right away. It was one of the first pieces of advice that I got from a, another fitness person that I also started promoting to my clients when I first became a trainer. And when people followed it, it worked. And the advice was, uh, look, if you want to if you want to get lean, don't eat past 6 p.m. It was like, and the number changes. Sometimes people say 7 p.m. Sometimes mm -hmm. people say 5, but it's usually around 6 o'clock. So. Oh, so I 100% agree that that's one of the top ones for me, but my experience is different with it. So I had already learned the law of thermodynamics already by this time, and I'm being told by clients. Clients are coming to me, oh. and they're hiring me, and they're saying, well, what do you think about me eating after 6 p.m.? Do I have to stop eating? I'm like, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. You can eat whenever you want, so long as the calories are 
aligned with your meal plan that I gave you, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what time. Of That's the day. right. It doesn't matter what time of the day it is. And so that was one of those. I, what I thought was bad piece of ice is that with people were reading whatever book was going on at that time that was making that popular, mm-hmm. and because the science didn't support that. I shit all over it, right? Because what what they what the fitness you know people tried to say or the way they explained it was, oh, past six p.m. you're not very active, so mm. any calories you eat past six p.m. you're more likely to store. If you eat it early yeah. in the day, you're active in the day, and you burn it off. And that's totally false. That's yeah. not, it's not at about all. calorie burning. Yeah, it's really a, more of a digestion thing that I found is is really the benefit or, of this advice or habit thing or just yes. behavior. Of that Absolutely, because here's what really, happens. That's really where it's at. Here's what happens when you don't eat past six p.m. For most people, they reduce their calories. Right, naturally. naturally. That's right, naturally, it's, and they make better choices. They do because right. if you look at the choices that people make with the foods that they eat, the bad choices. There's really there's a time when we tend to make yeah, bad. Where food those choices. cravings sneak in? It's typically later yeah. hours. It's Ice almost cream. always yeah. after 6 p.m. Yes, ice cream, popcorn, candy, alcohol, all these things are Chips. are typically snacked on after 6 p.m. Yes. And that to me that's where this adv- and which is funny cuz I originally as a 20-year-old trainer would hear that I would scoff at it or mm-hmm. you know shit all over it and then explain the science and that is that's not how your body works and you can eat I eat at midnight cuz I yeah. do, you know, like you can do it too. Mm-hmm. Yet at this point in my career I'm not realizing how important the conversation around behavior was. Yet. Yes, and it's not just about the mechanics. It's a lot. In fact, the mechanics don't matter as much as the behaviors. That's the most important thing. So I, I went, I went one side, and I went to the other side, and then I came back. So I started out in fitness, hearing it was bad to eat past six p.m. because of what I said earlier, right? Mm-hmm. If you eat calories late at night, you're not burning them off. And so I would tell people, and then I got my first certification. They taught us the law of thermodynamics and like, it doesn't matter. Calories are calories. Then I told people, eat whenever you want. And I noticed when clients would eat, stop eating at 6 p.m. versus clients that just ate whatever they wanted, they did better by stopping at 6 p.m. Yep. And I couldn't really figure it out and start, until I started to piece the behavior piece together. And I said, oh, here's what's happening. When I look at their reported food intake, all the bad shit happens after 6 p.m. It's almost never before 6 p.m. Yeah. It automatically lowers calories. And that tends to be when our willpower or whatever tends to, you know, fall off. So not eating past 6 p.m., there's no magic fat burning, you know, time or whatever. It really has nothing to do with that. But rather, giving yourself a a time tends to, and especially if it's based around your behaviors. By the way, if you're a person who has your worst meals or breakfast, which is very rare, but let's say that's you, you know, some you know, you're one percent of the population where you're like, oh, I eat really healthy after six p.m. It's before noon where I really screw up. Well, what if you did a I don't eat anything before noon? That might actually work with the behaviors in a way to make you eat. Well, better. isn't this what supports a lot of the positive claims that come out of intermittent fasting? Totally. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot of the 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 benefits that uh, is touted about intermittent fasting, a lot of that just has to do with this window of time that you have to eat. And most people, if you only have a eight hour window that you can eat in, it's just hard to over consume. And because especially of, if you're working. And you're yeah. Like, yep. Yeah. Especially if that's when your window is. So you just, you have a tougher time doing it. And, and when you're more likely to do it is when you're sitting on the couch watching TV. And so this piece of advice that I thought was crap back in the early two thousands when I was 20 years old, uh, I now think is great advice. Yeah, it's got some value to it, right? It? And yeah. I and I think that it's just it's the it's a way that we communicate it to our clientele that listen, here's a good tip. I'm not going to tell you, and then and I like these type of parameters because it mm. it's it's a better relationship with food, right? So instead of saying like you can't have this food, you can't have this food, you can't have that you, food, you can have it. Yeah. Just right. don't eat past six. Yes, right. Don't eat past six p.m. Just it's stay. almost like a trick. It is a trick. Mm. It's like one of those little trainer hacks that I didn't realize what a hack it was until later on because of of understanding the behaviors behind well, it. Well, and also, I mean, it, it does affect a lot of things too. It has that trickle effect of like that makes its way into like your sleeping habits. It's true. As well. That's true. So, you know, like it, it's just one of those pieces of advice that you could just say something simple like that that you know the behavior after that is really going to benefit. No, well, that's a good point. You started to say something, we kind of cut you off, and it's true, uh, you know, because you brought up the digestion thing. Like which it, which is, is not a small thing. No, and, and especially if you're somebody who already has digestive issues. So if you already have digestive issues, 
You eat past, you know, 7, 8 p.m. at night when you're not moving around and burning all those calories. And then you add in the fact that those are probably not the best choices that you make. Yeah. Now this is just this, this compounding effect that you're going to get from it. And then it disrupts your sleep, right? And then their mm -hmm. hormones are off a little bit. You don't get, you don't get as much recovery. Right. You crave different shit the next day. Which we didn't value that much. I mean, I know I didn't as a trainer. I didn't really emphasize that enough in the recovery process and the actual, you know, the way that we could maximize our efforts in the gym. Yeah, well, your, your your organs have a circadian rhythm. Uh, so, you know, light will help set your circadian rhythm, tell you when it's time to go to sleep and be awake. But so does your digestive system. So when you eat food, it tells your body you're you should be awake. So if you eat right before you go to bed, you're almost always going to have worse sleep. Well, I love, I, I like, I really like this topic and this conversation because we have some friends in the space. Our friend, you know, Lane Norton, who I have a ton of tremendous amount of respect for. Uh, we know a, a Dr. Nadalski guy who's built a following off of this. And, you know, they, they've made it, they've made this mission to go out and just destroy anybody who, who puts out anything that the science doesn't support mm -hmm. 100%. And now the bone that I have to pick with them with that topic is they do that so aggressively and so hard that I think that a lot of people get lost in the weeds. And there's some valuable pieces of information that we have debunked with science, but I still think have tremendous value around behavior. Yeah. So to give you an example, um, and let's say I didn't communicate this well, right? Let's say I, I told people, I did a post and I said, don't eat processed foods processed foods make you fat. Right. right. Yeah. And then you would get someone like this Dr. Nadalski who would go on and say, this isn't true. If you if you eat 1,000 calories from processed foods or 1,000 calories from whole natural foods and you're burning X amount of calories, doesn't make a difference. You can lose weight or gain weight either way, which is true. That's true science. Now, the problem is that what I was saying is also true. Now, I might not be communicating it right. Heavily processed foods, they don't themselves make you gain more body fat but they do make you eat more. Mm -hmm. Just avoiding them oftentimes results in fat loss. That's right. And so because they made their point, because the science doesn't support that specific thing, what they may be doing is moving people away from a behavior that's going to benefit them. And, and, that, and to me, yeah. that's where the real experience, when you've trained tons of clients and you start to pick up on these type of patterns of, okay, so we've dispelled that this whole science, the science around eating past six o'clock is false. But when I've told all my clients that it's false and allowed them to do that, what are the things that I start to see in common? Totally. Yeah. I see, oh, wow, when you did make that bad choice food-wise, it was at 9 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock at night. It's like now now what I've done is because I've proven it wrong with science just to be right, just so I could be more right, right. I've actually sent more people in a worse direction. I got a fucking problem with 100%. that. 100%. Mm -hmm. So here's another one that I like that's really good. And again, it was told and communicated totally wrong. But the it actually has some good effects, but not for the again, not for the reasons that they that we thought, right? So back in the day, actually some people still promote this, but back in the day we were told that if we wanted to do cardio to burn body fat, if we wanted to add a little bit of cardio to burn a little extra calories to burn body fat, one of the most effective ways to do it is in the morning, first thing on an empty stomach. Right. Now now the way the reason why they say to do this, their reasoning was if you do it first thing in the morning without any food, you have no glycogen left in your body, you're mm -hmm. more likely to burn body fat for fuel, right. and it gets you leaner faster. Now, it's totally false. It doesn't matter if you eat before or after, whatever. It's all total calories versus total calories burned. Makes no difference at all. However, behaviorally speaking, when people wake up in the morning and do cardio before anything else, you typically find that they get leaner faster. Now, why is that? Because you're starting your day off with a healthy with behavior. Activity. Yes, and, and studies show this, by the way. Studies show one of the easiest ways to get people to eat better is just get them exercise. Yeah. So if you have, if, if when I would work with a client and I'd want them to, and I'd want to play, a, not a trick, but I'd want to do an experiment. Like, okay, let's see if this works. And I would say something like, okay, here's what I want you to do. Before you eat anything, I want you to do a 15-minute bout on the treadmill or do 15-minute body weight exercises. And they would track their food for me. And I would notice when they would start the day off with a little bit of exercise, they would make better food choices. Studies show this across the board. When people start exercising, they start to make better food choices. Also, when people start the day off with something positive, it sets the stage for the rest of the day. And, and successful business people have known this for a long time. Also, mm -hmm. when you start the day off with activity like that, you are moving more active for the rest of the day versus going straight to a job where you sit down. So when I was competing, I did this. I would get up before I, every morning. I'd get up an extra hour early, and I would go walk fasted. 
Now, the, the benefits of it was not, oh, I'm tapping into the glycogen stores quicker. Or, I mean, I'm burning. They're all burned off because I slept last night, so yeah. I'm tapping into fat faster. Nothing to do with that other than, guess what? If I had to if I had to do it before I started my day, I had to get up an hour earlier. Yes. Yeah. What would I have been doing had I not done that? Laying in bed. Laying yeah. in bed, sleeping, not burning any calories whatsoever. So now you're upping the volume of potential movement that you can add into the rest of your day. That's right. And then and then what that would end up doing was I also wouldn't go straight to eating, Arthur. Then I had to come home. I'd shower get dressed it would prolong the time that i'd end up eating mm-hmm. and by the time i and then i'm i feel motivated because i started my day off right. right i got a great walk a little sweat maybe I even read a little bit so now i've got this i'm already winning the day type of attitude mm-hmm. and it set the tone for the the decisions that i would make for the rest of the day one of my favorite i know so i finally have it's taken me a long time to, to get everybody to work out in the morning and we've all decided to do it right we work out here in the studio and, and here's this is the truth this is for the audience one of the main reasons why everybody now is working out together, because I guarantee you, I could ask you guys right now, do you guys like working out in the morning versus in the afternoon? No, it sucks. You, you prefer working out in the afternoon. Mm-hmm. Why do we do it in the morning? Because it makes us better throughout the day. Yeah. We work out in the morning. We come in here. We do the podcast better. We're better in business. We're better with our conversations. Everything seems sharper because you set the intentions for the whole day. So that cardio, first thing in the morning, fasted, essentially what you're saying is cardio before you do anything. What it does is it sets the intention for throughout the day, and that's the reason why a lot of people see success with it, not because there's some magic and, fat And let me tell you, coming. extremely mm-hmm. valuable. Yes. Very valuable, and a lot of people have tremendous success with this. It's just another one of those things that wasn't communicated very well, and then people like our friends that I'm talking about right yeah, now- don't, It doesn't do it. doesn't make, make a difference. Can't there's wait, no value. Exactly. Can't wait to jump all over it and dispel it with yeah. science and say, that's not how the body works. That's Debunked. Not how, right. And, yeah. then they, and then they trash it. And then what ends up happening- Person says, there's no value. I'm it, not going to do that. Then they don't do it. And it's like, you know, that's really unfortunate because in, in, in this mission of being more right- about the science that people were communicating improperly about it, you've just now convinced a mass amount, especially if you have a large following and a bunch of people that are paying attention, you've just now convinced a large percentage of people that would have benefited from that that habit. If they would have started that habit and done that, they would see tremendous behavioral change and better habits in their life had they done that. Yeah, so mm-hmm. it's like I, I win this argument, but I lost the goal. You know, it reminds me, I was watching this uh, video with this marriage like expert. And he says, you know, when you get an argument with your spouse, is your goal to win the argument or is your goal to improve your relationship? Mm -hmm. He says, because sometimes those are two different things. You might be able to win and have your wife, you know, whatever, like, oh, I I beat, but now she hates you and resents you. You may win, but what's the desired outcome? Exactly. You got to think about that. Yeah. So here's another one. And this one's hilarious because uh, I remember when I learned that this was bullshit, I told everybody it was bullshit and I probably did a little bit of harm. And this is the notion that doing high reps with weights, burns body fat, whereas low uh, reps and heavyweight builds mass, right? So we were told this, right? Oh, you want to get cut? Go do lots of reps. You want to build? Do lots of low reps. Now, I learned later on that, no, that's not true. Reps build muscle. So just do do the one that builds muscle for you, and which is typically lower reps for most people. The problem is then people never started to experiment with the other rep ranges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, if you if you believe that high reps gets you lean and low reps builds muscle, and you're already a, a lean kid, and you don't ever do them. Right, or you're just and you're doing them and you're and you're like, "Oh, I, you know, sometimes I get lean for summer, sometimes I get bulk." What you end up doing without realizing is you end up phasing your workouts. Yeah. And, and so you naturally play with different rep ranges because you think that the value of this one is to burn fat and the value of this one is to build muscle. So it does work to burn fat and build muscle both to do high reps sometimes and low reps sometimes, not for the reasons that they the told you. The value is just changing it up. The really. value isn't changing it up. Yeah. Otherwise, you'll stay in one forever and be like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it's just Who another cares? one of those examples, like you said, that is wasn't communicated properly. Right. You know, and again, well, the fitness community comes out, we're saying, we're saying things like that, then real quick, Somebody wants to come over and be like, "That's wrong. The science doesn't support that. This is what it says. This is what this is what rep range is better for building muscle." Mm-hmm. Now, what does everybody do? Now they only train in that hypertrophy range, and they mm-hmm. never get out of that. That's right. When I I can tell you firsthand that some of my biggest gains came from when I actually switched over to low. I mean, high reps. Right. You know? So it's it is it's it's another area that is bad advice that we thought was good advice when we were giving it, and it's really just the way that we were communicating. Yeah, and again, like all reps, all rep ranges within reason, so we're talking probably yeah. below they 30. They all develop muscle. Yeah, they all build muscle, and the one that's going to give you the best results 
regardless of your goal, okay, so whether you want to burn fat or build muscle, the one re the rep range that works the best for you is the probably the one that you're not doing, right? So when you switch into a new rep range, you get this new stimulus in the body and your body, it's like when you first start exercising and you get these newbie gains right off the gates, right? Well, let's say you're always stuck in the five rep range. You always do five reps, always do five reps. And then you're like, you know, I'm going to go do 15 reps on my exercises. There's like a two week period where your central nervous system has to really adapt and you're going to get really fast adaptations because it's something you're not used to. So this is what the studies don't show. Studies will show, you know, eight to 12 reps builds the most muscle. Maybe that's true or whatever, but here's the deal. If you always train 8 to 12, then 15 to 20 will build more muscle or 1 to 5 will build more muscle. So the, the inadvertent effect of telling people high reps do this and low reps do this is the average person who sometimes bulks and sometimes cuts. Oh, wintertime is time to bulk. Summertime, time to cut. Without realizing it, they're phasing their workouts. Now, of course... It, it, it makes the argument stronger because they're like, I did get, I noticed yeah. great results when I switched it, my rep range. It did happen that way. Yeah. Yes, but it's not, again, it's Do not Do you guys remember reasons. what one you got stuck in the longest? Like, would, Justin, what were you training like for the longest as far as your rep range? Do you At remember? least in like the five rep range. Yep. Yeah, that, yep. that was like my, my sweet spot. I just loved it. And that's the thing too. We, we're creatures of habit. I, I really love to train that way. And so I wanted to go to the information that was like, promoting that the most and so it's like you know you kind of look for that like well who's who else like thinks this way and does things this way and so we're just led like human behavior we're led in that direction of doing what we like that's such a good point something that we do right when we when we're attracted to something like all these points that we're bringing up it's really dangerous because you can actually find articles and studies to support whichever side you totally want. whatever one you want to side with in this you can go after that's and to this is your there point. Is science there, yeah, right. This was Sal's point the other day that he he made in the podcast talking about how things have gotten so political, even in science and studies. It's like you can I can find a study to support both sides of this argument. So it's really dangerous on how you decide to search this. If you go in with that, you want to prove yourself right and the other person wrong. You very easily can by searching a certain yeah. way. I remember, so I got stuck in the in the low rep ranges because back in those days, when you read the magazines, if there was an article on math. Mass building, that's what they always said, right? Mass building principles. It was always heavy, low reps. Anytime I read an article on get shredded, get lean for summer, it was always high reps. Mm -hmm. Now, as a skinny kid, I'm like, I don't fucking, I don't want to get shredded. I'm already shredded. I want to get big. Yeah. I'm, a, big. I'm avoiding anything over five reps. So I did everything low rep all the time, all the time. And then I remember I got, I got a, I don't remember what, which magazine, it might've been Flex Magazine. There was a bodybuilder, Frank Hillebrand, I think was his name. And he wrote this article about how he got his best physique. And I liked the way he was built or whatever. So, you know, of course, when you're a kid, you look at the guy you want to look like, and you're like, I'm going to take his advice, right? Mm -hmm. Not very scientific. <laughs> but he goes, you know. Very common though. But he goes, you know, I get my best gains in the 12 rep range. And I get that. He made this whole thing about it, but basically saying, this is what built the most muscle on me. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go try 12 reps. Now, of course, because I'd trained five reps or lower forever, I went and did 12 reps. And what did I experience? I got muscle gains yeah. fast. Whole new stimulus. Real quick, I grew. Now, the problem with that is then you I thought, with that. yeah, I'm like, oh, this is the answer. That's exact, this is the exact same thing. Almost my same story, too, is uh, because all the magazines, right? If you were reading like Muscle and Fitness and uh, muscle de Muscular Development. Yeah, flex. And, yeah, Flex. Like all the jacked body pillars, everything was like six reps. If you, mass. Mass builder, yeah. arm arm blaster. Every, everything to get bigger was all about you got to lip in the low rep range. And since I was a skinny kid, it was like they're right. all never spend any time so years like five years at least of consistently lifting in that rep range then all of a sudden some bodybuilder guy comes to me and says you know and I'm, i see him he looks one of the most impressive guys in the gym and i'm like hey what do i need to do and i kind of tell him you know, what are you doing and he goes oh you go you need to go lift like 15 reps I'm like what i don't want to get ripped or lean i'm already lean look at my abs you know he's like no no no, no. That, you haven't you need to go do that i did that i blew up like i never had before and then what ends up happening i marry that shit for, Stuck in there forever. <laughs> for the next five years because i saw those results and so the answer for people that are listening is that you know they they each old hold tremendous value and you and you just got to be careful not to get stuck in any of them and you should be getting out of them no longer than six eight six to eight weeks is is as long I, as i like three to four right, right we like three to four i mean that's how we that's how we program right but i, I would tell somebody like you're, you're you got to get out of there by six yeah, or eight the best rep range to burn fat is also the best rep range to build muscle okay right. remember that so the rep range you want to pick 
regardless of your goal is fat loss or muscle gain, is, is going to be the best one for both. And that rep range is going to be the one that your body just responds best to. And it's usually one that you're not training. So when you switch over, I don't care if you're dieting and getting lean or if you're eating a lot to gain muscle, when you switch into that new rep range, you're going to see the best results. So always remember that. The one that burns fat is the best is also the one that builds muscle best. Move in and out of different rep ranges. All right, so here's the next one. And this one, this one I railed against for a long time until I realized that it was actually good advice, again, not for the reasons that they said. So coming into the fitness industry, my and I mean as a professional, as a trainer, I first came to it from the bodybuilding world. Now, not because I was a bodybuilder. I was a young kid and no way I would have gotten on stage and done well, but I, all my advice, all the stuff that I had learned, all the stuff that I had read came from the bodybuilding side of the fitness space because my goal as a kid was to build big muscle. So all the information I got before I had my first certification was from, you know, muscle and fitness, flex magazine, Iron Man. It was from talking to bodybuilders. It was from people who were into that side of fitness. And what they always said was you need to eat a ton of protein. Eat mm -hmm. so much protein, it's going to come out of your ears. Like protein, mm -hmm. yeah. like crazy. You know, one and a half grams, two grams per pound of body weight. Go crazy with the protein. And so I did this for a long time. And I remember I got my first certification, and I remember there was a nutrition component, and the person teaching it was very smart. By this point, I want to become a trainer. And I'm starting to realize bodybuilding is, there's maybe some truth into it, but they might be wrong about some stuff. And I remember this guy up there going, yeah, uh, you don't need two grams of protein per pound of body weight. And he's bringing up studies. And I'm like, those idiots. They just wanted me to buy all their supplements. These guys are morons. Yeah. You don't need nearly that much protein. And so when clients would come to me and say, hey, should I be eating tons of protein? I would say, no, 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 no. You don't need that much protein. It's not, it's not great. Well, here's the truth. And again, it's not for the reasons that they said. When people, tr the average person, I'm not talking about the fitness fanatic. So if you're watching this right now and you're like a, a maniac, fitness fanatic, don't listen. But if you're the average person, you're probably not eating enough protein. And if I tell you to eat a lot of protein, you'll probably eat the right amount of protein. And what does that do for you? It increases muscle gain, but here's the biggest gain, the biggest uh, benefit. It controls your appetite. Boy, does protein do that effect. In fact, Adam, right now, what you're doing with your nutrition, with your elimination diet, your protein's through the roof because right. it's mostly meat. And what are you finding with your appetite? Yeah, suppressed completely. Oh, yeah. totally suppressed. Right, right, right. Now you and I have a little bit different experience with this, and uh, I I was in defense of the bodybuilders because of what I saw. So I, I too remember learning that and and hearing how much protein I needed to hit, and I struggled. And being a fitness fanatic, being somebody that was taking in the shakes, I still had a hard time with it. Now I was a tall, lanky, active kid, and so. That tells you why I had a little bit of a challenge getting there. But then as I started to train clients, and my, remember 65%, maybe 70% of our clientele are, are women, middle-aged, uh, and I was uh, assessing their diet the way they ate. So many of them were eating 1,500, you know, 1,800 tops calories and grossly under eating protein. Mm -hmm. And then when I would tell them, let's start targeting more protein, we still were following way short. So this was one of those things that I remember that that was, even though they were off on the science, right? Again, another area where, you know, there's people in the space that were quick to, to hammer the, the uh, I think, the over-exaggeration of how much yes. protein you need. But the truth is, most people need so much more than what they're consuming that hammering this, you got to go more, you got to go more, you got to more, go more, is probably pretty damn good advice for most people. Yes. If, if you are somebody who knows that you struggle, I, I, in fact, I've had so much success with that being the only thing that I told someone to follow. So yeah. I would get, I would get these clients sometimes, and this came in around when I was about 20, about three, four years in, I, I started to piece this together because it was such a challenge. I thought, you know what, I'm going to stop. And what I learned about how satiating protein was. I'm going to stop telling people, eat the, can't eat this, do eat this, do this. Like, all I'm going to say is like, you need, okay, Miss, you know, Susie, whatever, you need 140 grams of protein. I don't want you to think about anything else. Get your 140 protein. Just hit that. Just hit that. Get after it. Try and get it and try and get it through Whole Foods. If we need to use the protein shake or the bars, we will. But I want you to try and get, that's all I want you to think about. And I had tremendous success with clients just by having them shift their focus over to protein and just going after it. Yeah, it just naturally sort of brings down the overall calories because, totally. because right away it's satiating and you're just not uh, you know, inclined to keep adding in 
in a lot of food right after that. And so that would be an easy one for me if I'm trying to adjust, uh, you know, one of my average uh, clients is, is to just like literally just dude, focus in on on the protein and, you know, watch what happens to, to just that oh, one thing. Take, look, you take a 130 pound female and you tell her, eat 110 grams of protein every day. Don't miss it. This is what you need to hit. This is your goal. Prioritize this. And they do that. Now, how many chicken breasts is 110 grams of protein? Yeah, like three six-ounce chicken breasts. Okay, Come so on. three. So a 130-pound woman, she's going to have to eat like three six-ounce chicken breasts right. to hit that. Right. Or there's beef or whatever. She's naturally going to eat less. This just happens. Protein is extremely satiating. It really kills your appetite better than any other macronutrient studies prove this. Of course, there's a thermogenic effect that's very minimal. That's not you know what, what we're talking about here. It does encourage muscle building. So indirectly, because you build more muscle, you speed up the metabolism. But really, the main benefit, no joke, you eat a lot of protein. If you hit that first, you're just less likely to eat a lot of calories. And it's hard. It's hard to get there. It's yeah. hard to get there protein wise. And it's hard to overconsume. If if you were again referring back to the diet that I'm kind of following right now, which is an all meat diet. It's like hard to overeat. Yeah, I mean it, that you have was to force feed yourself. Well, that was one of the problems I had way back when we did ketogenic diet, like four years ago. Was and I happened to be doing it right when I was trying to build and bulk because like I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I was like I can't I can't get this four thousand five thousand calorie intake that I needed at that time to put on size. I was like I just can't, I can't do it through all mostly meat and or fat and protein. I was mm -hmm. like I was getting f filled up so quick. The same thing goes for the meat, and it's so easy to overconsume carbohydrates. Oh, oh boy. So just by telling a client, you know, I'm not telling them they can't have carbohydrates, but saying, listen, you got to get this in protein, focus there, they would fill up and they wouldn't even want that much carbohydrates. Well, the average client I would always get, like, I mean, whether they realize it or not, still had that that sort of food pyramid uh, idea that, that grains are so important. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. You know, and so they, they literally would base their meals first there and then build upon that. And so to, to flip that on its head made a massive change. Yeah, it's really hard. It's really hard to overeat protein unless it comes packaged with a lot of fat, a lot of, a lot of carbohydrates and other things that make it taste good. But protein is very hard to overconsume. Try it. Try overeating chicken breasts or try overeating lean red meat. You, you can even go process. Try overeating beef jerky. Now mm -hmm. compare that to a bag of potato chips right. or candy right. or even a bowl of rice, even a bowl of plain rice. You know, you could probably eat quite a bit. Very difficult with protein. So not for the reasons, again, that they said, where it's this magical macronutrient, if you eat tons of it, all, right. but really it's because it, it really crushes your appetite and makes you eat more. Well, yeah, back to the behavior thing. Yes. I mean, I feel like all these, there's there's a theme in this, yes. right? That a lot of these things that we decided to come out in the space and and harp on about the science being off, and, you know, in and we try to do that, and all we ended up doing was turning off a bunch of people that were probably implementing good habits in their life yeah, yeah. because now we, this science guy comes out and says, oh, that's false. That's not true. Well, yeah, the science and the way that people are communicating is not true. But, but there's is, value. Yeah, but is there good? Is that, is that a good behavior or a good habit for most people? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, it is. So here's another one. This And this one I love because, again, I went in both directions, right? So, again, I came from this, like, building muscle space, get into the personal training space. And they talked about the pump. Again, this was one of my first certifications. And they talked about how bodybuilders really want the pump. And then they explained the pump. Here's what happens when you get a pump when you work out. More flood rushes into, but excuse me, more fluid rushes into the muscle, then comes out. You get this engorged feeling. It's temporary. No, it doesn't build muscle. It's just an ego thing. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about the pump. So then I would tell people, don't worry about the pump. It's not that big of a deal. But then I noticed this with clients. I'd be training clients and they'd have a body part that would be stubborn. Uh, you know, let's say it's a woman and it's her glutes or it's a guy and it's his delts or whatever. And we're working out. And I would always notice this, that when they would start building the muscle would be when they'd start getting the pump. Like all of a sudden, I'd be training this woman for five months. We're trying to get her glutes to connect. I'm trying to work out. And then finally she's like, oh my God, I feel like they're tight right now. And I'd be like, oh my God, you got a pump. Shortly after, we would see muscle growth. Now, was it the pump that caused the growth? Probably not. But chase getting to the point where you can connect to a muscle enough to get a, to the pump, that's a good behavior. So getting a pump requires connection. It requires, mm -hmm. you want to pump any muscle in the gym, you have to be able to concentrate, squeeze it, and isolate it and work it. Is there value in, in that kind of connection? Absolutely. There's even more to that that I, I ended up un uncovering, right? So same thing, heard, you know, heard that touted so much in the, in the bodybuilding community and then going like, oh, that's so overrated and 
you know, all you're doing is sending a bunch of fluid into the muscle. You're not really building a ton of muscle out there. There's not a lot of value there. Then I started to put together like what I saw happening when I started training, like strength people, training clients in the strength phase when they weren't ready for it is poor muscle connection. Like yes. you're, and then also technique. So the, the protocol for hypertrophy training or, you know, chasing the pump type of training is this higher repetitions with this slower control tempo, a four, two, two tempo is yeah. kind of the, so up four seconds up and yeah. four seconds, excuse and me, really two seconds up, four seconds your way through it. Yeah. 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 And it's, to, to do that. Okay. A whole six second rep, right? Four, two, two would be a full six second rep on anything that you're doing is a very slow and controlled movement. Very deliberate. Yes, and very few people train this way. And that, what I found was when I started having my clients chase the pump or train this way, was I could get them to actually use better technique and form. That better and technique form helped them connect better to the muscle, like you're saying, then in turn gave us more muscle. Right, so now we go into the strength training part of that, and they can feel the little nuances and the ways that their body's getting out of position, and they can self-correct a lot more effectively. And that's because they have that connection established, and they can feel their way through these types of exercises massively uh, beneficial. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if you have uh, you find somebody with a lagging body part, you're pr more often than not, not always, but more often than not, you're also finding a body part that they don't, get a pump in as easily as other body parts. It's just true. Now, if you taught the average person who's doing resistance training what the pump is and how to find it and how to search for it, it's going to lead to behaviors that are beneficial for them. Now, maybe not, not necessarily the pump itself, but rather the slow controlled reps, the squeeze, the feel of the movement, really feeling the connection. All of those behaviors lead to better results. So the pump has great value for the average person. Again, not for the reasons that we thought, but it still has tons of value. You know, I want to add something to this list that we didn't we didn't bring up that is I'm reminded of right now that I remember. Let, let me guess what it is because I have one too. Oh, let me hear. Let me hear. What yeah. You so mine was like there was this old adage of like you know try and drink a gallon of water a day. Oh, okay. That's actually a that's good one. actually another good one. Okay. And that's something that I actually wasn't thinking. Go ahead. Tell, I mean, that's, oh yeah, share that because. So a lot of times, like people found that to be like unrealistic. Like I can't like drink. This is like outrageous. But like just uh, the the conscious effort of trying to actively pursue water, just like we we're kind of talking about with yes. protein, uh, led to better behaviors and it led to you know energy spikes, totally. cognitive enhancements, uh, you know joints like some some pain alleviation, like lots of benefits in that direction. But it wasn't about the gallon. It's really the pursuit. No, there was, right. there was a book that came out, and I think in the early two thousands or late. 90s that would try to make like water be like this you know miracle miracle thing that's happening and although there's tons of benefits around it but i know that book was like touting that like crazy and everybody was asking oh yeah because and then you got the science people who are like a gallon is too much you don't need a gallon of water right. every day it's not going to benefit you you don't need a gallon it's too much water it's not going to hurt you but you don't need it but the result of drinking a gallon of water the truth is like what justin said is you're trying to drink a gallon of water. You're not drinking anything else. That's number one. Yep. Your appetite is usually controlled. That's mm -hmm. number two. Yep. Number three, and this is a funny one, but it's true. You're moving more. Yeah. Why? Get up and pee. You're walking to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. And then four, I'd right. add to that, you you end up eliminating like other beverages that have calories. Yeah, I in said them. That. Oh, okay. Yes. yes. Those, yes. Those, those alone, because you're focused on that, I think. That. So here's another one that I remember. So uh, the angles for targeting certain body, like parts uh, of your body part, mm. right? So that was something I, I originally thought was true. Like that, this works the peak, this yes, works the bottom, this yes. works the outside, this right, works the inside. Yeah. Right, So that was something, one, originally, I believe that from a lot of the, the muscle magazines. Then science comes out to support. That's not how it works. The muscle's attached to these two anchor points. It's getting the entire thing worked. You can't target, you, you can't even isolate a muscle, much less a part of a muscle. So that's right. all bullshit. So then I went completely away from it. But that was, I didn't understand the strength curve at that time. Yeah. And I didn't understand the importance of manipulating the strength curve and how valuable that is to seeing change and adaptation in your body. And so there, here's another area because the science comes out to say, oh, that's all bullshit. You can't target a part of a muscle. That's not how they work. So I stopped caring right. about the angles and changing things like that, neglecting the benefits and the understanding of what the strength curve is. Right. Mm -hmm. So to, to, to explain it differently, right? So they would say that a concentration curl 
work the peak of the bicep and a preacher curl work the bottom of the bicep. Now remember a concentration curl is I'm bending over and I'm curling a dumbbell up like this. This is the hardest part of the lift. This is when I'm directly opposing gravity. A preacher curl, my elbows are in front of me, my arms are on a bench. I bring the barbell down or dumbbell down. And this is when the weight is directly opposing gravity. So this is the hardest part of the rep. Up here, the fully contracted part is really easy on a preacher curl, but really hard on a concentration curl. Right. Now, am I working the bottom of the bicep in a preacher curl and the peak with a concentration curl? No. Hmm. No, the Just bicep- more stress. There's two attachments for both heads are real close to each other. You can't work the bicep from here to here or here to here. The whole thing works. So that's false. However, just like Adam said, there's lots of value in training the different strength curves. The concentration curl requires lots of tension in this 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 fully contracted position. The preacher curl re requires lots of tension in this more extended position. That's right. And the muscle fibers, the way that they attach when they slide across each other, those attachments are stressed more mm -hmm. at different po points based on the strength curl. That's right. So yeah. the value in angles is tremendous. You're just putting more emphasis in a different part of the strength curve. Yes. It's, the value is tremendous. Again, not for the reasons that they said. That's right. And the danger is if you get caught up and because you hear that information that that's false, that doesn't, and yeah. then all of a sudden you start doing all the same bicep all, exercises. Yeah, all barbell curls. That's right. It doesn't you, make a difference. That's right. And then you start doing all the same ones because it doesn't change. Well, okay, well, the problem with that is that your body is so adapted to that, that plane of motion, that strength curve, that one of the best things you could do for the peak or the side of the bicep or the t whatever part you want is to literally just do a different angle that will actually manipulate and change the strength curve. So that was one of those ones that early on I adopted, thought was right. Then I find out the science disproves it. That's not true. You cannot yep. isolate a part of the muscle. Then I go, oh shit, well then I'm just going to disregard doing all this weird angled shit all the time. And then later on understand the, the, the value of manipulating the strength curve and what mm -hmm. that does for adaptation and growth. So those are the ones that I think were the big That's ones. That's a really good one. Right. Look, if you like our information, you'll love mindpumpfree.com. We have lots of free guides there to help you with fat loss, muscle building, even targeting specific muscle groups. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find your favorite podcast hosts on Instagram. So you can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam at Mind Pump Adam. Somebody listening might think, oh, that means the first month or two, nothing happens. No, no, no. We said the scale might not move. That's right. That doesn't mean nothing happened. Remember the earlier example of where I said, person who does it wrong loses 10 pounds, but five pounds of muscle, five pounds of fat. So they're the same. They're just smaller, same body fat percentage. What we're talking about is the scale doesn't move 